flutter has leapt from the circus into uncircum... Un I had to <laughs> oh, oh, I wanted to say uncircumcised, oh, I know. Oh, but uncertain <laughs> circumstances. Okay. Nice. I hope you like my 40th slip. That's my, uh, my 2016 <laughs> gift to you. Yes. Please welcome to the stage, Errol and Hughes. My instinct as a child was that if I wanted to stay alive and not die, I needed to stay safe. I needed to sit on the sidelines, I needed to keep my mouth shut, and um, my parents said, safety first. And I bought it hook, line, and sinker. I was a very serious child about my safety. The things that I thought in my head but didn't say to the people around me were, you think I'm crazy? Do you think I'm stupid? I'm not leaping. I'm not jumping. I'm not going there. You're going to leap and there's not going to be a net and you're going to die. It's crazy making what you're doing. You're going to be sorry. And I have a head on my shoulders and you guys don't know what's going on because I know about safety. See, I grew up in the 50s. And as a child, I remember two things. They came every year to my town. The first one was the circus. I couldn't wait to go. Sometimes I got to go more than one time because my dad was in the rotary and they sold the tickets and things were kind of floating around. And I remember watching the trapeze artist and I remember her standing on the platform and I remember her leaping off and trusting that the hands of the other guy, the net, would be there. And then, if it was, that then suddenly she would let go and she would trust that the trapeze bar was going to be there for her. I wanted to be her, but no way I was ever going to do that. The other highlight of the year, out of the two, was the rodeo. I loved going to the rodeo once a year. They would bring in all the... Uh, animals and the bulls and the horses and I would see girls my age bust out of a gate and race a horse. I wasn't doing that because I wasn't going to fall off but they would race around these barrels and turn sharp corners and go back really fast. Sometimes they would jump off and they'd take a rope and tie the feet of the little calf and then there were the clowns. They wore those outrageous colored outfits and they flaunted themselves in front of the bull. What were they thinking? And then they would run and jump in that barrel. Oh, I had the clothes, but I wasn't going to go out there in front of the bull. That was just too much. All of this, I think, was supported by my family, my parents, the teachers, and just my society. Because, you see, I was a girl, and you were supposed to, uh, you know, be taken care of. You were supposed to be careful. You might break. Girls were fragile. I heard things like, pretty is as pretty does. Now be sweet to everyone. Children are to be seen and not heard. No one likes a child that throws a hissy fit. <laughs> Over time, my curiosity started to become greater than my need to be safe. I started feeling things boiling up inside of me and I just thought, they're just gonna explode if someday and I just go into a million pieces. My voice kept saying, no, be safe. But then the voice right beside it was saying, yeah, yes, go for it, do it, leap. And I remember things where I leaped and were big transitions for me. One was that escalator. In my small town, we would go to Oklahoma City, the big town, and in the stores there were escalators. And that day that I took that leap and stepped on that first step and went all the way to the top and got off that platform, it was like so much empowerment. I was like, let me do it again. <laughs> there was the diving board, terrified, 
had to leave, wanted to leave, went back and forth, back and forth on the diving board, and finally leaped. The thrill of the drop, the thrill of going into that water, and all that silence. I wanted to do it some more. The piano recital, oh my God, I knew my piece, but to get up there and play the piano in front of all those people, but I just walked out, sat down, and played the piece. And the sense of relief that I had when it was over, and the audience that applauded, I said, yes, I'm going to play in another piano recital. <laughs> then my dad, he was an engineer, never did anything small. He built me a swing set with a trapeze because of my joy at the circus of the trapeze artist and he built it out of 12 foot steel poles so it was taller than our little ranch style house there was a swing i could kind of do that and there was that trapeze but it wasn't long before i was going back and forth on that trapeze i was letting go and jumping off and then one day my mother looked out the window, and she told, tell, told this story many times. She climbed up the poles on the edge, you know, on the end of the, of the um, swing set, 12 feet, and when, then went across the pole on the top to the other side and came down. So I was on my way. Things kept coming, driving cars, getting in airplanes, trying out for cheerleader. Oh my gosh, that was terrifying. But I won. Wow. Again, feedback for staying out on the skinny branches. Then the 60s happened. Sex, drugs, rock and roll. Everyone was leaping. I was leaping. I didn't need drugs to get high. None of us did. The leaping that we did in the 60s was unsurpassed by anything I had ever experienced. And so once I started going forward, there was no way to go back. And once I got a taste of the freedom and the sensation of being on the other side of safety, I couldn't stop. My adult life followed with you know, one foot in each door, you know, be safe. You know, I got married, but I got married to somebody safe, somebody who would take good care of me, who had a job. But then I also got divorced because staying in the marriage was a greater risk to me than leaving. Gloria Steinem was my idol. Her life looked better than mine was. She didn't have any kids, she was free, she was using her voice, and she had sex on her own terms. It's like, yes. She is my idol now. That was in the 70s. And then travel opened a whole other adventure. I kind of went in as the last person because no one could go to a Grand Canyon whitewater trip. And there were 16 of us. And it was terrifying. They don't even rate the rapids in the Grand Canyon. And our boat flipped. And I fell out into the water which was moving at about 25 miles an hour, freezing cold. I was probably as close to death as I've ever been in my life. But I finagled as I moved. I knew to put my feet up, so if you hit a rock, you wouldn't, you just break your legs. You wouldn't smash yourself so much. But I was able to get kind of out of the current over to this little part here, and I was hanging on. <laughs> and what I had learned in my training for safety was that always trust the voices in the boats, not your voice. Because the water, number one, can affect your judgment very quickly because of how cold it is. So as I hung on, I read the lips of all the people in the boat. Let go. I let go. I leaped off of that cliff edge. And of course, when I did, they were able to rescue me by throwing me in, because I got out of the main flow of the water close to where they were on down, they were able to throw a thing for me to get and then wheel me in. So that was a, 
a, a scary adventure. But again, all those things just made me not scared of leaping where, whatever it took. But of course, I didn't always have some crisis. And the crisis was, I began to leap too big. <laughs> and then I was too much, too loud, too big, you know, needed to be smaller. So I spent a lot of time over here trying to be what people wanted me to be, to fit in, to make friends, and not be loud and obnoxious and too big. But then this other side of me was like, that's who I am, that's who I am. Mm -hmm. I found myself in the last chapter of my life. I'm in my 60s now. And at that point, I had to say, what is it that I want now? Am I finished leaping? Am I going to leap again? And I decided I wanted to empower other people to do what I had done and to come from the point I had gone from to another point and empower women to do that in particular. And in order to do that, I was going to have to take the biggest leap. I was going to um, have to uh, walk my talk if I was going to speak in that way. And that, the studies say, is the most terrifying thing that people can do and their biggest fear and their biggest leap is to do public speaking. Mm -hmm. And that is where I went. I went on stage and I used my voice as a storyteller. I still suffer from stage fright. I still go there, but I just do it anyway. But there's one leap left, the biggest leap of all, for all of us, I think, and no one talks about it. It's death. I'm looking forward to what will be the biggest leap of my life it will happen when I least suspect it, and there will be no net. Thank you.